I want you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17. Acts 17. And let's read verses 29, 30, and 31. Acts 29, or excuse me, Acts 17, verses 29, 30, and 31. Paul says, For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art or man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. By the way, the word winked has a other definition, not just a you know good job, but it means uh, but it it's also, one of its also uh, other definitions means that God ignored it. He let it pass for the time. That's what it means in this usage. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. The main text today is going to be the second part of verse 30. All men are commanded everywhere to repent. It's said to be a command of God, and it's said to apply to all men and all women as well. Uh, then in the next verse, he tells us why the command is given. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, that man, of course, being Jesus Christ, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him, Christ, from the dead. The way that you know Jesus Christ is worthy to judge you and to judge the universe one day is by the fact that he didn't stay dead. He came back to life again. That's what makes him different than every other being in the universe. And the day is appointed. We don't know the divine calendar of heaven. Just as the Bible says, though, that it is appointed unto men once to die, Hebrews 9, 27, you have an appointment with judgment. Whether you're an unsaved man, you're going to be judged for not having received Jesus Christ, or you're a saved man or woman, you're going to be judged at the judgment seat for what you've done for Jesus Christ. But you have an appointment um, to be judged. We don't know the exact day and time. We don't know exactly the precise moment, but uh, it's fixed. And God's going to judge the world. So he sends out a proclamation, and he commands all men everywhere to repent. And um, if you don't want to be brought to judgment, then what you ought to do is you need to get right with God now. Amen. You ought to repent of your sin Turn from your sin, recognize the guilt of your sin, admit it to God, and confess it to God. Don't try to hide it and say, well, I'm not nearly as bad as some people, and I'm not that bad. I haven't done that much. Admit your guilt and turn to God and get it fixed. That's what you ought to do. And if you're a Christian, you need to turn to God and get it fixed. Quit doing it. It's a great thing to get rid of the judgment. You know, it's a great thing. To get past it. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Let me ask you, are you in Jesus Christ? Are you in Jesus Christ? I got into Jesus Christ November 5th, 1967, when I was six years old. And you know where it happened? Yeah, right about there, right in front of this podium. That's where it happened. It's been a great blessing to stand at the same place uh, just a few inches, a couple feet away from the place where I received Christ as my Savior. And I got into Jesus Christ. The sins I committed, uh, whatever sins I've committed as a Christian, the sins that have been put under the blood of Jesus, those things are gone. They won't be mentioned again. They won't be held up uh, uh, to accuse me of something and held against me. The Bible says, He, that's God, hath made Him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21. Let me ask you, are you in Jesus Christ? Christ took the judgment of God in your place for your sake. 
And the punishment for your sins has already been measured out, it's already been meted out in the person and on the body and the flesh of the Lord Jesus Christ as your substitute. Long before you ever committed those sins, even long enough ago before any of us were born, Jesus Christ died for your sake and died for my sake. And the glory uh, and the honor that Jesus Christ alone is worthy of and should, and should receive is now imparted to you by the new birth. What a wonderful transaction. Tis done the great transactions done. I am the Lord's and he is mine. Happy day, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. Yeah. Romans 8, 39 says, um, Neither height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you in Jesus Christ? Amen. Ephesians 2, 6 tells us that God had raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. If you're in Jesus Christ, you are seated in heavenly places with God, enjoying the Trinity and enjoying a company of angels right now. I can't fully explain it, but it's nevertheless the Word of God. And if you are in Jesus Christ, then you know the love of God. If you're not in Jesus Christ, you don't yet know the true love of God. But you say, well, you might ask, well, how do I get into Jesus Christ? That's a very simple question to answer. The Lord Jesus said, John 14, verse 20, At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. The way you get into Jesus Christ is by asking Jesus Christ to come live in you. It's a very great trans uh, 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 transaction that can take place. Very simple matter, simple proposition. But part of the transaction is the idea of my sermon today, and I call this remembering repentance, remembering repentance. I realize it's not a flashy title, and you'll be able to tell when it's posted on YouTube uh, next week sometime how many people really take repentance seriously. If I was going to ask whether the disciples ever had flatulence or gas, and we put that on the title, There'd be millions of people clicking that on. People more interested in the nonsense, ridiculous stuff, than they are in something they need to hear from the Bible. It's unfortunate, but that's sort of the mentality of half the people who get all their information from the internet anyway. There's another half that enjoys our ministry. I got a call just earlier this morning um, asking if we could refer uh, someone to two or three Bible-believing churches in Illinois and one in Hawaii. And, but she said, I see your website's been having some trouble. So I was able to give her a phone number of the bookstore in Pensacola. I said, call down there. And they'll let you know where some PBI graduates are and where they're preaching. They might, there might be someone in the area you need to find a Bible-believing church at. And um, she was very grateful. And she wanted to tell us how much blessing she gets from our um, internet ministry. And so there are some people who we've been able to bless. The Lord. And thank the Lord for them. And people whose questions we've been able to answer along the way. And I said, well, we're trying, we're trying, we're chipping away little by little. But our text today says that God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Ezekiel 33, verse 11 declares, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Isaiah 55, verse 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. When Isaiah says, let him return unto the Lord, that, that suggests the person knew the Lord once before. He's been out there fooling around with sin, messing around with sin, doing those things, uh, satisfying his flesh, things that feel good, things that he enjoys doing, and uh, wants to maintain his good reputation in the eyes of others. God says, you need to turn back to God. Amen. That goes, that's not just, that wasn't just good advice for a Jew in the Old Testament who was rejecting the law. That's sound advice for a Christian today. Amen. If you're living a life of sin, living for your flesh, I know a couple of things about you. Number one, you're not reading your Bible. You haven't read your Bible in a while. Please. Those things are contrary to each other. The Word of God is contrary to, to the will of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. As we see the gospel first being preached, 
In the New Testament, we find John the Baptist, uh, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, out there in the wilderness of Judea, and he preached a very simple message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Messiah is just about to show up. You've got to make yourselves right, prepare your hearts and minds, and be ready to receive him when he does show up. He kept preaching it until the Lord Jesus showed up, and his sermon changed from repent to behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. And then the Lord Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, began preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 4, verse 17. And the Lord Jesus sent out his twelve apostles to preach for him, and they went out preaching that men should repent. Mark, Mark 6, verse 19. Get back to my text here. On the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter uh, took up this same wilderness cry. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Verse, yeah, verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto, the, unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They weren't asking, What must I do to be saved? Like the Philippian jailer would in chapter 16. But they were asking, If what you say is true, in light of the fact that we just murdered our Messiah, now what should we do? What should we do now? And Peter said to them, verse 38, Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And now in our text, we find Paul in the city of Athens, Greece, raising the same wilderness cry, that God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Really, there is no such thing as someone who makes it to heaven without repentance without repenting, without turning from their sin and making things right with God. Man must decide to turn from his sin and turn to the will of God. And that's how a Christian maintains fellowship with God, too. Turn from your sin and turn back to the will of God. Now, your name may already be in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you can say, I know if I died tonight, I'd wake up in heaven. But are you living like someone who ought to live, how someone should live who's on their way to heaven? They're trying to get away with sin, hoping nobody notices. Everybody still thinks I'm spiritual. Everybody thinks I'm a good Christian. When down inside you're as rotten as hell. Later in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul declared that he was sent out by God, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The command or the commandment to repent didn't end with John the Baptist preaching. It's just as alive and just as valid and just as important now as it was any time. Paul commended the church in Thessalonica for their uh, show of repentance, which he heard from the church of Macedonia. Quote, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living God. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 Repentance is turning away from sin and turning yourself toward the will of God, the desires of God. It's still necessary in the life of a Christian. In fact, you can't be a consistent Christian living for the Lord Jesus Christ if you're not repenting once in a while. Every day you wake up, uh, you've got a new challenge to face. You can't enjoy yesterday's forgiveness Today, today you're going to have to get new forgiveness. You're going to have to go back to God once again. You get on your face and your hands and knees and talk to God and say, God, I've been rotten. Please forgive me. I'm sorry for my sin. Get your nose back in the Bible. Start reading. Let God speak to you. Let's consider what repentance is not. That's the point of this sermon today. What is repentance not? First of all, repentance is not simply fear. Fear. To be afraid is not to repent. Maybe I was very uh, eloquent. I could paint a great picture 
of the terror and the horror and the fiery judgment that's going to uh, attend everybody who wakes up in hell without Jesus Christ. And you're scared to death, scared out of your mind. You could be scared, but that's not repentance from your sin. That's not repentance at all. What if I brought a loaded revolver here to church one day and I pointed at somebody here and I said, listen, you've never made a move. Every time we have an altar call, you don't even get out of your seat. Don't budge. I want you to repent. You might be motivated right then and there to repent, right? Once I put the gun away, or once they hauled me off and took me to jail, you wouldn't be repenting anymore. You'd, get, be com you'd completely uh, leave your mind. So fear is not the same as repenting. They say there are no atheists in foxholes. That's an old expression. Some guy has got the bullets and the mortar flying around him, and he's afraid of getting shot or dying on the battlefield. Suddenly he turns to God in desperation. He's not interested in repenting of his sin. He just wants to come out alive. He just wants to survive and wake up tomorrow morning and, uh, you know, in one piece. That's not repentance. Fear is not repentance. It seemed like the king of Egypt was going to turn to God once he saw the plagues falling on them. But once Moses uh, prayed to God and the plagues were lifted, he went back to his old ways. Went back to his old ways. He was afraid, but fear is not repentance. You can read, read about that in Exodus chapter uh, 9, verse 27 through about verse 35 there. So repentance is not simply fear. Secondly, let me say this, repentance is not feelings. Having some emotional feeling. Some people think repentance always requires some, some emotional response to God. A lot of crying, maybe. Um, a lot of weeping to show your contrition, to show your sadness for how things turned out, what you've done. You might think that um, there are a lot of men in prison who are sorry for their sins. And they're sorry for what got them there. They're sorry for what, what they did in their life that led them to be behind bars. Well, they may be sad. They may be sorry, but they're sorry they got caught. They're sorry because they got a long sentence, or they're sorry that somebody else didn't get caught uh, who was just as guilty as they were. You know, studies now have shown that the one demographic in the United States that has the highest self-esteem levels are prison inmates. It really does. Check that out. So feeling bad and having bad feelings doesn't necessarily mean you've repented or turned from your sin. The recidivism rate, that is the rate of people who get out of prison and then end up breaking the law and getting back, thrown back into prison, is so high in this country, it proves out my point. They weren't sorry about it at all. They feel bad. They feel bad because they got caught. Um, Proverbs 23 I'm not going to have you jump all over all these verses today, but Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 through 35. A guy might be sorry because of the accident he caused under the influence. He may be sorry for his drunkenness, his drinking. But the end of that section, Proverbs 23, verse, I think, 35, says, uh, I'll seek it yet again. He doesn't learn from his lesson. I graduated from high school with a guy, nice guy at the time, I thought, but... Uh, he thought he could go through life as a casual drinker, and he was in charge of everything. He and his uh, girlfriend or fiance, they went off to some party, and they had done too much drinking. And on the way back home, uh, he ends up hitting a car that was parked on the side of, a, of the freeway and kills his own girlfriend in the front seat. He had no criminal history up to that point. He never had any problem with the law prior to that point. And because of all of these things, his involvement in, you know, school clubs, his involvement in other activities, it was reduced to a very serious misdemeanor. He wasn't charged with manslaughter, didn't go to prison for it. Do you think the guy learned his lesson? No, he's a drinker still. He's still a drinker. Some people don't learn their lesson. Some people are hard-headed. Some people are hard-hearted, right? But there are other people who are hard-headed. You can't speak any sense to them. You can't teach them anything. You can't tell them anything. They know best. They feel bad, but feelings are not repentance. Thirdly, let me say this. Repentance is not simply doing penance. 
This is the mistake a lot of people make, and it's a, based on Roman Catholic mythology, like all of the Catholicism is. It's based on mythology. But many people who call themselves believers in some, of some kind, they've gotten the idea that to repent means to give up something. They have to deny themselves. They have to give up something that they enjoy, something that gives them joy and pleasure, just to prove to God that uh, they're serious with him. And so anytime a preacher brings up the subject of repentance, like I'm trying to today, their eyes glass over and they get this look on their face, they're bored. They don't want to hear about it because they don't want because they've been conditioned to think that repenting means I have to give up something. That's not, that's not even repentance. But they've been conditioned to think that. And so you bring up the word repentance and uh, they're not interested in hearing it. They're not interested in hearing listening to you the rest of the sermon because they don't want to give it up. They don't want to give up their sin. They don't want to give up whatever it is that's giving them so much joy and fun and, um, at the moment. But uh, the concept of a future, uh, the, uh, their future is just misery and boredom and tediousness and unhappiness because I don't want to have to give up anything. The truth is, when you bring up the subject of repenting of their sin, they get upset and they really are impatient because they enjoy their sin. And they know the Bible says, uh, Hebrews eleven twenty five 25, reveals that sin is pleasurable for a season. They know that much. How many of you remember that, that uh, commercial, was it for root beer or something like that? They talk about all these sweet uh, pleasures of, that you you know, was it cheesecake or the cherry pie or something like that? If desserts... Uh, didn't taste so good, you wouldn't want them, right? If desserts tasted bad, then uh, you wouldn't want them. And I guess they were trying to promote root beer, a and root beer, diet root beer. Remember they're promoting diet root beer, saying it tastes just as good as real root beer, so you don't have to give up all the pleasures of the taste. You know, it's a pretty lame way to sell root beer, too. I have to say that, but, uh, but there was a commercial like that. And uh, if sin was awful... If sin was terrible, nobody would be engaging in it. But sin is pleasurable, the Bible says, for a season. And uh, so the idea of having to give up something to show my right standing with God, it, uh, it bores people. They don't want to consider that possibility. And yet, to be truthful, that's not even repentance, just giving something up. Repentance is not praying more. Praying more. Let's just pray more, and that'll show that we've repented to God. It's an essential part of having fellowship with the Lord God. It's an essential part of enjoying fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ to speak to Him in prayer and to know that His ear is ever open to the prayers of the righteous. You can talk to Him at any time, day or night, and by His word, He'll speak to you. And sometimes by a prompting or some intuition, some instinct of the Holy Spirit, He speaks to you. But don't depend on that. Go to the Bible. Depend on the Bible more than you depend on anything else. But um, if, you, if you think that praying more is the same thing as repentance, you need to be educated. And if you're still trying to get away with sin, you're wasting your time. God's not listening to you anyway. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, 18. But your iniquities have separated between you and God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Isaiah 59, verse 2. God's God, and God hears everything, but he's not obligated to respond. As long as you're trying to get away with sin uh, on one hand and make everybody think you're a moral, upright, standing individual or a good Christian on the other hand. You can't live like that. Repentance is not just praying more. You're spinning your wheels. You're wasting your time, wasting God's time uh, going through the motions of prayer if you're still hanging on to sin that you don't want to give up. You don't want to quit. Point number five, repentance uh, is not just a resolution. It's not simply adopting a new code of ethics or conduct and behavior. I'm going to try harder next time. D.L. Moody said if uh, there's a little rowboat out in the lake and it's got three holes in it and you patch up two, the boat's still going to sink. Adam was kicked out of the Garden of Eden for one sin. You know that? Do you think you're better than Adam? How much sin have you committed? Have you committed more than one sin? 
Do you have more than one sin on your record that hasn't been confessed and hasn't been uh, given over to God? You haven't sought forgiveness for? Then you're in far worse condition than Adam. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus 3, 5. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that saves you, not by any good works on your part. And then Paul says, um, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, 20. I can't depend on my own strength, my own ability to please God or live for God or satisfy the, the desires of God to be a good testimony, to be a good soul winner, to be diligent in my Bible. I have to ask God to give me the strength and the energy and the insight and the wisdom to do all of those things. And so do you. To repent is to turn from your sin and turn back to the Word of God and to the will of God. It's a turning from one to the other. And it requires a definite understanding of your own, in your own heart and in your own mind of how holy the Lord God of the Bible is and how unholy you are by contrast. Do you understand how absolutely flawless and impeccable the Lord Jesus is? There's no wickedness with Him. There's no uncleanness with him. There's no stain of defilement with him. There's no impurity with him. How are you ever going to measure up to a being like that? You can't. But you can come back into alignment with his desires through repentance, turning from your sin, say, God, remember that guy that went to the Lord Jesus and said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief? You might not... You might not even recall everything you're guilty of. So you, you might have to make one of those blanket prayers, lay everything. Lord, reveal to me something I've done that, I'm, that I've forgotten about, I'm not mindful of, but I need your, the power of your shed blood to cleanse me from it and make me pure once again. Cleanse me once again. Give me a new start. Psalm 8, verse 4. David asked, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Alongside the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I are nothing. Can you see, by your sin, you and I have offended the very nature of the Lord God of the Bible. To repent isn't just to change your mind about how you've been living, but to repent is to turn and head in the right direction once again. Repentance isn't making a U-turn. Isn't just making it's, it's turning away from what you're doing and going back in the opposite direction. It's not making a U-turn and then changing your mind and going back again. I guess that's what I meant to say. Repentance is going back uh, in the opposite direction, away as far away as you can get from sin, from the influence of sin, the people that uh, cause you to stumble and uh, bring about sin. Every opportunity to sin, every temptation to sin. The, the man who merely asked God to come into my life and change me, that man hasn't repented. You hear that, that lame um, substitute for the gospel and for the, planet, uh, the, the prayer of salvation all the time with these TV preachers, internet preachers, come into my life. You know what? Satan is in everybody's life, to some measure, in some measure. So you got to be careful. Someone might ask, Preacher, are you trying to manipulate us, hoping that we'll, we'll get out of our seat at the end of this sermon? Not exactly. But I do think today we'll have an, an altar call. Let's bring this to a conclusion about what repentance is, what repentance is not. 